So this is a photo of my dad many years ago doing what he's always loved, which is skiing. He loved it so much that he eventually became a ski instructor on the slopes of Japan. And lucky for him that he did that because he met my mom there. <laughs> she learned how to ski from him and they both fell in love with skiing, that they became instructors together. Their love for skiing is through and through. And as kids growing up, they took us whenever money and time and snow allowed out to hit the slopes because it's time to learn a lesson about life or two, my dad would say. Imagine this, two ski instructors taking four kids down icy hills on sticks. Sounds like great parenting. That's called building up your strength. My dad is in the front of the pack, modeling the way, and the little kids are like little ducklings following behind him. And mom is in the back, gently encouraging and leading from behind. I love to ski now. It's taught me a lot about life. Dad was right. It's taught me that you can pick your own path when you get better. It taught me that falling is inevitable, but did you get back up again? It taught me that you can sometimes veer off into the trees and Lord, did I do that? <laughs> but you will always find that cup of hot chocolate down at the hill. What I learned though and remember most though is that my favorite time skiing actually weren't even skiing. It was just sitting on the lift with my dad, sharing tips about the previous run, getting a bird's eye's perspective of the others below, flowing in their different ways. It was that chance to really get a lift moment, to step back and to reflect. And I believe that life is actually full of lift moments. When you take some time to step back and reflect, ask some questions, and think for a purpose. Life's lift moments, I believe, are a part of the most important skill of the future at this moment of crossroads of learning. And to me, that is learning how to learn. As a coach, and as an educator, I think a lot about learning all day, every day. Learning, learning, learning. It's my favorite topic to think about. But it's less about what I know. It's more about how can I help another person create an intentional lift moment in their life to actually use their life experiences as the teacher, to make meaning of what they just experienced in a new way, to step back and to ask questions that allows the brain to make new connections never imagined possible. Literally just breathing can do that for our beautiful brains. I work at an organization called The Future Project, and our mission is to help young people discover who they are and to activate their power. And I do this because I want to make lift moments possible for more young people to determine what they want to learn and how they go about learning that with their unique learning styles. I'm lucky to do this with an amazing group of fellow dream directors and other adults who support young people in building a greater sense of belonging, a sense of belief in what's possible, a greater sense of purpose and power. Because I don't want, and nor do my colleagues, we don't want to leave learning to chance. We don't want to leave learning to zip code. We don't want to leave learning to your ability, identity, or to your, li your style of learning. For me, if learning is about liberation, we want to find pathways where you can touch and tap into your own knowledge as that liberating force. Today, I'm going to share a few ideas that I've learned along the way working in the, the learning industry in my life that I hope can help you learn how you learn in your life, that you can walk from these, this auditorium today and apply them in your life right away. The first technique is to think about learning how to learn as a, the requirement is to map your own course. As an Asian American growing up in suburban Virginia, that's me, super cute looking. <laughs> I was oscillating between two cultures, one at home speaking Japanese, and then outside of that home translating English, de dependent on whatever was the dominant language. And it wasn't until right here at William & Mary which I adore and love, and that's why I'm back to, to talk about this today. At this American Studies program, my teacher said, why don't you create a reading list to discover all the authors that you haven't read yet? 
and it was the first time in my life that I read a book by an Asian American author, let alone a Japanese American female author, Monica Sone, who wrote about her Nisei experience growing up in the West Coast in the 1900s. I read her words, I was like, this could have been me. <laughs> but that's the thing. Before that time, I didn't know that my words could matter. I didn't know that I could write a book or that I could even create my own curriculum. And I thank William and Mary for that in the audacity of my teachers that said, Cosmo, you don't need my permission to write your own life syllabus. Take the pen and go. And that's what my work has been as an educator, encouraging all people to think about your life curriculum and what are you learning to keep up with the change that is inevitable in this economy? How are you learning not just what you know, but how you need to learn what's next and coming ahead? 79 is the average life expectancy here in the United States. That means for many of you in your early 20s, 70% of your life still left for lifelong learning. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you think you're done after college? Uh-uh, honey. That's 70% more time for you to think about what you want to learn. This is my life map. This is how I think about the, the things I want to learn. Because I have written my own job description so many times, because new jobs didn't exist a couple years ago. I have also learned things on the job when I didn't know how to do it. And I said, I want to learn. Give me the opportunity. And that is how you lead. The second idea I want to leave you with around learning how to learn is that it's not about being right. It's actually about deepening your joy and your curiosity to learning. You know when you're skiing and you're feeling a little rigid and you're going to fall? You got to let go. That's a little bit of the essence of this. 66% of college students have reported that they feel overwhelmed with studies at school. 50% of 5th to 12th graders say they feel stuck and 70% of adults in the workforce feel disengaged. I'm going to let that sit with y'all for a moment. <laughs> These negative emotions have a profound impact on our brains. It has a profound impact on our brain's ability to actually learn and to make connections because of the amygdala's hijack. And what happens is that these moments of discomfort are inevitable when you learn something new. I'm not saying that that's not going to hurt and be difficult, but when those learning zones touch into to panic or into comfort, you can actually have ownership to take a minute and have a little lift moment for yourself. You can even say that out loud. I'm, ha I'm having a mini lift moment, everybody, so they know. <laughs> I do that sometimes, and they know what I mean. That means step back. Take a moment to step back. For many years, I worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs around the globe, that came together for a week-long period to play, to learn, to work together. And they came to the program to learn technical skills about how would they grow their business, or how do they solve this sticky business challenge they were encountering. And time and time again, even the most go-getter of them all would say, Cosmo, the most important part of this program was the perspective I got from different people. It was the opportunity to slow down and ask questions I was afraid to ask myself because I haven't been able to stop. It was the moments like this that led social entrepreneurs to say, I want to pivot my company not from a place of pain and shame, but from a place of possibility. I want to take my business secession plan with honor, not with sadness. And I want to think about my personal wellness as important as my corporate wellness. These moments that we were creating out in nature were these retreats for the mind to rewire possibility and take it away from panic. Now, not everybody can take a whole week off into the mountains. I recommend it. It's a wonderful thing to do. But you can also think about a couple questions that allow you to take a moment, literally to breathe and to, to, to step back. And, and these are three that I recommend. What am I learning right now? What's going on here? What am I learning outside of just the, the visible learning? What's the invisible learning that I'm learning? And what is the gift here? I always say that there's a gift here, especially when there's moments of struggle and pain. What is the gift here? And finally, what am I committed to learning? Because learning takes effort, and your commitment will elevate what you learn. And ask yourself that in that moment. And sometimes it might be, you know what? This is too much. i got to take a step back. And that is OK. The idea is that you get to choose. 
The third and final idea that I want to share tonight is that learning is a group practice. It's a community effort. So build a learning team and stay accountable to each other. Our school system, our businesses, were set up a century ago in a factory-based model that minimized relationships and maximized standardization. The future is going to look different, and we're going to need different forms of learning that actually look at the diversity of all of our community members and think with equity and inclusion as the lens of how do we actually elevate our learning abilities. My learning teams look like a couple different things. It looks like a community of people who identify as women of color working in tech and social innovation. We come together every month in New York. We sit, we eat, we talk. We create a psychologically safe space to discuss whatever is on our minds. It also looks like my digital communities. After those retreats I was talking to you about, we also stay connected on WhatsApp. And I have hundreds of people that I'm in touch with every day that share resources, that celebrate the small and the big wings, the big wins. And it's all through a digital connection. It also looks like my quarterly P&Ls with my very near dear friend. And it's not P&Ls for profit and loss. It's P&L for purpose and love. And over a cup of coffee and some croissants, we actually check in and say, how are you doing in your work? Are you still in love with what you're doing? How, is, how are you pursuing your purpose? And we literally gut check each other so we can walk the walk and stay connected and accountable. And finally, it looks like our dream directors at the Future Project, people that are creating positive adult relationships in communities where this is necessary so that more people and more young people have a, have a safe space of belonging that allows their learning edge to be farther and deeper. So I bring us back to the lift because, as my father said, skiing is not just a sport, it's a way of life. <laughs> Learning is not just a skill, it is a way of life. And I believe that the future of learning depends on all of us leaning in to take learning as a powerful tool of liberation and of freedom that makes all of us stronger. Thank you.